Now, we should probably remind ourselves of what brings us together today. Science learning is a hugely powerful tool, which at best can enable citizens to understand, critique, and develop technologies and innovations, which will be shared by all, says the abstract of our event. But at worst, it continues, science learning can be ring-fenced for the most privileged, limiting engagement with science, technology, and innovation to a small subset, and further widening the gaps in society by reinforcing systems of inequality. How then do we make sure that the informal science learning sector works in pursuit of justice and equity? Ultimately, how do we empower a diverse generation of scientists, technologists, artists, engineers, or mathematicians to be resilient agents of change who realize a socially just world? This is what we'll be exploring together. Uh, but before we get to it, we'd like to take the temperature in the room. Uh, for this, we're asking you to answer a poll that will uh, pop up at the bottom um, of your window, whether you're in Facebook or uh, Zoom. And we'll be sharing the results in a few uh, minutes. A quick note on definitions. So you'll notice that uh, we're using informal learning today because it's being widely used in the literature. Let's not get too worried about informal versus non-formal in this context, if that's OK with you. Um, very shortly, we'll get inspired and challenged on the topic of social justice and science learning by our keynote, Frederick Bertley, who's the president and CEO of COSI in Columbus, Ohio. But before um, that, I'd like to introduce you to Mairead Hurley from Trinity College, Dublin. Mairead, you're the principal investigator of System 2020, uh, the pan-European project bringing us uh, this session today. Um, and I've given you the challenge of telling us about the project in precisely 90, maybe 95 seconds. So I hope you're feeling concise today. Thanks, Julie. I am bound to fail. Um, because really, System 2020 is to me, it's more than a project. It's a network and it's a community. It's um, a group of 22 amazing organizations across 19 countries who've been working together for almost three years now. So very difficult to only speak about it in 90 seconds. But really, we're a research practice partnership. So our task that was set to us by the European Commission was to find out how and where science is being learned outside of the classroom and by whom. So really to us, that last part was key. It meant looking for what was not there and whose voices were missing. So our labs to carry out this research were our practice partners. So these are the organizations within the consortium who engage the public directly with science learning. They vary in size and scale, but we share a few common threads that bind us all together. So we're organizations that are committed to creating learning opportunities that open science up to everyone. We promote and showcase science as something that's part of our culture. And we make links between science and other facets of everyday life and with other subjects, so particularly with the arts as well. So what did we do? Well, we created learning opportunities with these values that underpin our project. And with that, we opened up a dialogue with our learners. We gave them a space to have their voices heard. We examined what was going on. And we identified the challenges, the issues, the worries for the future. So we've got all these distinct terms and sectors. We've got science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the arts. We've got research and innovation. We've got formal and informal education. And really what we're seeing is that these are all parts of a multifaceted system. There are really complex interdependencies and, and challenges in one area may be caused by issues in another. So really it's our responsibility as researchers and as a project to, to use what we've learned about our small corner of this ecosystem and really to look at how these like butterfly wing flutterings may affect the weather systems of the future. 
So really that's why we're here today and why we've taken the future as our focus for this workroom series. We're really excited to see what we as a community can come up with together and how we can shape this vision for the future of learning and the future of society. Definitely not 90 seconds. Thanks, Bray. That was pretty concise. Okay, so I've also given you the challenge of introducing why we're going to uh, hear Farik Bertley as our keynote speaker today. Great, thanks, Julie. Well, Frederick Bertley, he's a scientist. We haven't just invited him because he's an immunologist, although it's definitely the trendiest of all the scientists these days. But we've invited him because he's a scholar and a science communicator. So he's the president and CEO of COSI. And I think he's got one of the greatest lines in a bio that I've ever read and something I aspire to one day. He describes himself as an evangelist for innovative thinking, ideation and challenging the status quo. So that's quite amazing. Really, for us, we've been looking at matters of equity and social justice in, related, in relation to informal science learning on this side of the Atlantic. But, you know, speaking about what's going on within a wider societal ecosystem, all eyes have been on North America in this past year in, you know, the emergence of issues around racial reckoning and political unrest. And so we really thought it would be very interesting for our community and important for us to hear from a keynote speaker who's really working with the, these issues of equity and social justice within this environment. So delighted to have you here with us today, Dr. Frederick Bertley. So Frederick, uh, Mairead and myself are going to retreat in the background. We'll switch our uh, cameras off and you're now free to share your screen and uh, bring up your amazing presentation and speech. You got it. All right. So I just want to check, can you see my screen OK? Yes. Okay, great. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Mairead Hurley and Ms. Becker, thank you so much for having me as part of your program today. Um, to all the listeners, thank you um, from across the pond. It's great to, to share some stuff with you today. Um, I'm going to speak rather quickly, but then we'll have some time for questions. So first, I want to begin by this. By the way, believe it or not, I just for the first time got on Twitter a few weeks ago. I normally wouldn't do this, but I committed to writing a haiku every single day that Frederick Bertley, feel free to follow it. Let me know what you think. All right, let's get to the introductions. It's always important that you know who is speaking with you. Um, so this is me. This was the good old days when I can actually grow here. I can't uh, much anymore. But the question was, how did I become a, a, a scientist, especially in the social equity kind of justice space where I'm a person of color? How did this happen? How did I become CEO of the year? How did I become Parent Magazine? Well, this is where it all started for me, or at least I wish this is where it started. My parents were from the Caribbean. My mom was from Barbados. My dad is from Trinidad. This is not the Jackson Five. This is my family. This is me, born and raised in Montreal, Canada. And growing up in Canada, you do what every other Canadian does. You play hockey. Now, I know you can't find me in this picture, so this is me. Sorry, um, to, can I, I, I really, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. I think we're just having a slight problem seeing your slides. We're still seeing your first holding slide, so. I would like oh. to see the hockey one. Maybe we'll just oh. take a second to figure that out. Sorry about that. So you're still seeing the, the system slide? Yeah. Hmm. I have no idea why that's happening. Um. Oh, okay, let me try that. Let's try that. Sorry about that, folks. So drive it from here. Here. How's that? That looks good. We see your Twitter handle. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Rewind. <laughs> All right. So I'm also, you know, kind of technically savvy, not really, but that's okay. So how do we go from that to, oops, oh boy. All right, let's do this. All right, part one, introduction. How do we go from this um, to um, me being a scientist here? And as you can see, um, you know, bunch of fun magazines. How did all this happen? It really started in the Caribbean. Um, my parents were from Barbados. My, my, my mom's from Barbados. My dad's from Trinidad. And this is the picture that I said is my family. This is not the Jackson 5. 
So, um, you know, but you can see we had a little resemblance, but really um, th this was me. I grew up in Canada. I wanted to be a professional hockey player. I thought that was going to be my future. Um, here's just some fun pictures of me, um, you know, growing up in Canada. And again, I apologize because the animations aren't happening, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. Let me just check something. Just make sure. Yeah. All right, so the animations aren't happening, but that's okay. So something happened along the way. I wanted to be this hockey player. Um, that's what happened to me living in Canada. But then um, I learned about this. For the younger people in the audience, that's the old school version of a handheld device. This was the first digital device. And I won't go through the details, but suffice it to say, I thought I was being smart at 10 years old. I tried to work with the electricity. I blew up my game. And for me, that was my aha moment where I realized electricity was way more complicated than just plugging something in the wall. And that's what got me hooked on science. And so I became an immunologist. Here are some of the schools I got to go to to train at. Um, and as was mentioned in the introduction by Dr. Hurley, being an immunologist today is actually pretty cool. I actually specifically worked in HIV vaccine development, which is a retrovirus. So I know a lot about the coronavirus. Um, and it's the first time in my life I felt that my professional PhD was actually worth something. But anyway, um, the really neat point is science took me places. I was able to travel all around the world. And when you think of diversity and equity, this is an eye opener because when you leave America or traditional developed worlds and you go to developing world nations and you're seeing all these different populations and you're recognizing, wait a minute, these men and women are scientists as well. It's really eye opening and, and very important. So, um, so that's my intro. That's who I am. Let's do some level setting. A couple of questions. A long time ago, um, you know, we were in the Stone Ages, but today, how many of you all texted? Now, of course, you don't shout to your screen, but I'm sure all of you have texted already. How many of you have had a prescription from a doctor in the last four years? How many of you eat food? Right? How many of you are viewing this presentation by sitting in front of the screen? Pretty much all of you, right? So I really, it really underscores that today we are in a science and technology, um, um, you know, compact world. For example, every minute we search on Google, 4 million searches. Every minute, 2.5 million bits of data are shared on Facebook every day. And this is adults. We check our cell phones, our smartphones about 150 times a day. And if you're a young kid, you can multiply that by, by three or four. We're talking about five, 600 times a day we're checking our smart devices. So we really are in a science and technology world, right? So we like to say here at COSA that science is indeed everywhere and for everyone. So really leveraging this diversity and equity piece is very, very important to the conversation. But if that's the case, if science is everywhere and for everyone, what's the problem? Well, well, there are a few problems. One, we're living in a rapidly growing science illiterate society, right? So this is research all around the world, but in particular the National Science Foundation in the US, um, Pew Research Center, et cetera, have found a lot of interesting information. In the US, and I won't speak to Europe, but I can tell you it's pretty close. In the US, believe it or not, one fourth of every American thinks that Earth is the center of our universe and the sun revolves around us, right? And then you think about dinosaurs, almost half of Americans believe that dinosaurs and humans coexisted, right? Um, and this I give a pass. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. I remember watching Fred Flintstones and used to get on the back of a dinosaur. So as a kid, you kind of think that, oh, maybe they live together. But as you mature, and if it's not this great big divide that Dr. Hurley talked about in education, you might know that that's not the case. I'll say it. So the stakes are really high. Um, and in particular, when you think about climate change, which is really impacting our planet, we're almost at 70% only with the International Government Panel on Climate Change says that people actually believe climate change is a thing. And then you talk about vaccines. There's growing vaccine hesitancy all throughout Europe, in North America. It's not great. And to put in perspective, you know, this is a baby in the US. We have measles vaccines here. They protect you from measles, but these parents elected not to vaccinate their child, they clearly got sick. And this all predates the COVID vaccine and COVID-19 situation, right? So now we finally understand that vaccines are really important. And so it's just, it's amazing how it took some time to get there. So the point is that this science illiteracy really is a pervasive problem. And so, and then finally, it leads to what Dr. Hurley alluded to at the beginning of her presentation, this concept of the education gap. They're the haves and the have nots and it's becoming more problematic. And so when you think of when the coronavirus pandemic first hit, 
back kind of January, February. In April, McKinsey and Company, one of the world's biggest, best consultancy firms, actually published this document. 1.6 billion children in almost 200 governments around the world were impacted by that. So that social and educational divide gap that you talked about actually really is, is much bigger. And so what are the solutions for that? Well, first of all, the good news is we can all play a role, whether we're big institutions, small institutions. I'm gonna share some of the stories of what we did at COSI. Um, number one, um, here's some basic math, right? We know that on planet earth, half of us walking around on two feet are male and half are female. And what's amazing is now half on the planet are also non-white, right? So if you're talking about solving you know, these amazing challenges, um, you got to look at all the available humans that are there to help support that. And if you look at some more details, Pew and The Guardian, those of you in the UK, again, according to Pew, by 2018 already, greater than 50% of Americans are non-white living in this country where I am today. And in the case of, of around the world, we're talking about by 2050, greater than 50% of the developed nations will be non-white. So when you think about diversity and equity, we have to think about everybody on this planet and not be limited. And so when you think about challenging and solving these big challenges, you know, the millennial goals from the United Nations or in the case of the US, the, these engineering grand challenges, how do you solve them? You solve them really by leveraging the men and women that are out there. Everybody needs to be included in these conversations and be at the table, right? The second thing is um, the concept of role models, right? When you think of, of a typical scientist, and unfortunately, I know because of the animation is not working, the slide's not gonna be perfect. But when you think of, of role models, typically, if you ask people to name a scientist, you know, they either name Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, or if it's Black History Month in the United States, they'll name George Washington Carver, right? The peanut guy. And then you ask them, okay, name some living scientists. It's harder for them than they, because you know, what's the issue? Those people are all dead. And so if you ask them to live, live a living, living scientist, they might come up with Niels deGrasse Tyson, or Bill Nye the science guy, right? Again, I mean, these are just two to three people. I mean, there's so many other scientists out there, but we don't know them. So how does COSI help this in terms of addressing the conversation? Well, it really is a diversity and inclusion and access issue, right? So you think about a program we have called the Color of Science. This program is really very simply, and again, the slide's not gonna come out, but that this is what scientists look like. They're not just old white men, with thick glasses and pocket protectors, but men and women make fantastic scientists and engineers, and so do persons of color. Similarly, um, so our program called the Color of Science is we bring in these amazing men and women, we pack the auditorium, and these men and women, again, we don't fly them in from different countries. These are men in our local communities. In every city in Europe where you have a university, you will have these people in your rooms, in your halls, in your labs, they may be your neighbors. And so we invite them in, we bring the public in, and we showcase the diverse spectrum of these men and women and say, look, they're in our community, right? Here's just another shot from the program. It always sells out. It's really a popular program. Um, this is not going to come out of forgery. And then at the end of the program, this is what we showcase. We have a reception for free where people in the community can come and meet these scientists and interact. And I have to tell you, it's like a rock star concert where a lot of these scientists end up writing um, autographs and signing autographs for these guests because they're so amazing that they met these people. Right. And so that's the adult program. Then we have a program for younger kids. We call it the Passport to the Color Science. This is where we take about 300 kids from inner city underrepresented communities and we bring them to our institution and we expose them to scientists. And so they go around the room and they meet with different scientists. And this is the first time in their lives they're actually meeting somebody in the flesh and bones that actually is a scientist. And as you can see from the images, they get to do some science. For many of these kiddos, it's the first time in their lives they're actually experiencing this. And you can see from the faces that they're really having a good time, right? And so it's a great way of engaging the public, reaching out to the community, bringing people into your building and showcasing them that there's scientists can be in all kinds of sizes and shapes, right? Because of the pandemic, we had to pivot and we do all this now digitally. And so what we've done since December, we've launched these every first Thursday of the month we recognize an amazing scientist and do a Q&A with them. And we have thousands and thousands literally getting on. We've been averaging about three to 4,000 people in a live stream for an hour to hear these conversations. This is Dr. Kathy Sullivan. She's the first American ast female astronaut to walk in space. Um, then we interviewed Caleb Anderson. This is an amazing young 12 year old genius who was accepted in Georgia Tech um, Institute of Technology. And that's the equivalent of MIT here in the US. He's studying aerospace engineering at 12 years old. 
And then um, next Thursday, I'll be interviewing Miss America. You might be asking, hey, Dr. B, why are you interviewing Miss America? Well, we're interviewing Miss America because she won Miss America, but that's not the main reason. She's actually a scientist. She did an undergrad in biochemistry. She has a second undergrad degree in molecular biology, and she's working on her PhD. So talk about you know, diversity and inclusion. Imagine her not just influencing young girls, but young boys who grew up to be men get to see that you can be a pageant queen, but still be an amazing scientist. So we're really looking forward to that conversation. The third thing I want to talk about is, you know, again, trying to solve this education gap pieces. We've got to evolve um, what education looks like. This is a picture of the first public school in the United States of America. It's called Boston Latin. The school was formed in 1635. This picture is taken from 1830s. And you can see all boys, it, desks in rows. They had these two teachers in the back, circled in red, who had all this amazing information. They would share that information with you, and then you'd memorize it all and regurgitate it. And so that's what school was, you know, two, three, four hundred years ago. The problem is um, when you think of where we are today with technology, you know, we don't use a we don't use a horse and carriage, which is what you're seeing behind there. We use planes, trains, and automobiles to communicate. We don't work with smoke signals anymore, right? We have all these digital devices to communicate. And so the point is we've evolved all kinds of aspects of technology in major ways. Unfortunately, the one space we haven't evolved is our classroom system. Similarly, you don't use a regular map, you use um, GPS when you go around. But our classrooms, on the left, you have the original classrooms. On the right, you're looking at a typical classroom today. What do you notice? The desks are still in rows, but the seats are empty. Why? This is where the average kid is. And so if you're trying to get them engaged, you got to come up with a different kind of education system. You got to have to be more hands-on, interactive, get these kiddos engaged in powerful ways. And that's what we're doing here at COSI. And that's what many folks in the informal science space are doing. And in particular, making sure all kiddos are represented in these kinds of programs. All right. So how does COSI help uh, meeting people where they are? We talk about, we want to meet people where they live, learn, and lounge. When you talk about the social divide or the inequity gap, one of the biggest issues is people feeling comfortable to come to your institution. People feel like their voices need to be heard. The best way to do that is to meet them where they are. And we talked about where they live, learn, and lounge. And so to that, um, when you think of the education gap, which is growing, one of the ways we can resolve that is, is by a bunch of programs I'm going to go through in a minute. So we looked at three different fronts, the digital front, and then the hands-on front, and then partnerships. For the digital front, we actually um, launched this program called COSI Connect. So you can go to COSI.org, that's our website. And on that website, you will see a series of all kinds of information, all for free. This is, this is curriculum correlated information that aligns with the US science learning standards. It is all available for free. The parent can download it, the kiddo can download it, and of course the teachers can download it. And in the case of the pandemic, for the last year, this has been hugely helpful because the teachers have been able to use this as support for their kiddos as they're doing this distant learning. Um, the other thing we did digitally is you can't physically come to our building right now because we've been closed, but we 3D filmed our, our exhibitions and now we push them out. Again, you can access these for free online. And not only do you just do a walkthrough of our dinosaur gallery, for example, but there's all these QR codes and different things to give you augmented access to, to really cool experiences, right? So that's the, the digital. Many people have done that, whether you're a small institution or a big institution, people have reworked their website to make their information accessible. But the one big thing, us being an informal science center, like many of you on this, on this um, conference, you know that going to a museum with hands-on interactive experiences is part of that experience. So how do you do that in a context of a pandemic? And in particular, you got a lot of underserved populations that may not be able to come to your museum or may not be able to physically get to get the experience. How do you take it to them? And so that's where we launched this program called the Learning Lunchbox. It's basically a science kit and it's got everything you need for five different experiments. And again, everything is in the box for five different experiments. These experiments can be done one a day, one a week. There's a lot of information that depending on what grade you're in, you can do a deeper dive from kindergarten all the way to grade eight. This is what it looked like inside COSI. We literally became this operation place where we were packing up these boxes, but we didn't do this alone. It was very important for us to work with other partners. And so that's where the partnership is key. And again, when you're thinking of solving these problems, 
this is not a situation where you have these conversations by yourself in your own space, but you want to engage outside persons, outside groups, and you definitely want to develop partnerships. And for us, this has been hugely successful. So these kits during the pandemic, we've been donating them with a partner, several different ones. In this picture, you're looking at what's called the Children's Hunger Alliance. Once a week, they give food to needy families. And so we give the food, they give the food, we give these science kits. And so we came up with this concept called Feeding Hungry Lives and Feeding Hungry Minds. This is us, just another shot of it. Um, this got so popular. This is in one of the more distressed or poor communities in Columbus. You can see the line of cars that are coming to actually come pick up these kits, right? So we got really excited here in Columbus. And we said, well, how can we go to scale? So we decided we want to hit the whole state of Ohio, not just the city of, of Columbus. And so we worked with what's called the Ohio Mayor's Alliance. These are about 150 mayors from across the state of Ohio. And we worked with them and together we were able to deliver kits to many more folks across the state. Here again is an image. Look at the lineup of cars coming um, to pick up these kits. Here's another shot. This is actually interesting. We brought a thousand kits to this one city called Dayton, Ohio, and over 1500 cars came to pick up their kits. So again, this is a way of getting this stuff into the hands of the needy, meeting them where they're at. Um, we also have some national partners, which we're really proud about. In particular, NASA has helped us develop the space kit. This is the first space kit that NASA has supported. And so we have a space box with a bunch of NASA content and our content. And we also partner with Virgin Hyperloop. We are their, their um, educational partner for the United States of America to ensure that STEM education is available for everyone, in particular around the engineering sciences and around um, getting underserved populations to learn about these things. So it was really exciting. We had both Sir Richard Branson and his wife, Holly Branson, tweeting and texting all about the partnership with COSI. And so right now, with all the excitement around these kits, we've developed a space kit, water kit, a human body kit, a dinosaur kit, a nature kit, and we're working on an energy kit. And again, when you get these into the hands of these kids, their minds are open and they're super excited and they feel more comfortable that they too can have a chance of learning, loving, and being engaged in science. So with the success in Ohio, we're now branching out to Kentucky, um, West Virginia, and Tennessee, and eventually throughout the rest of the United States. So we're very happy about that. What does success look like? So here's what success looks like. Here's one of the partnerships. This is a big medical company called Cover My Meds. We work with them to give out 500 kits in an underserved population in the city of Columbus. This is us, it's on a Sunday afternoon. We're handing out these kits, right? The kids are getting excited and then this happened. These two kids came with no parents, no adults. They heard about this, they got the kits from us and right there in the parking lot at the park, right next to the parking lot, they opened the kits and started doing science experiments. And if you talk about making a difference in people's lives, if you talk about really helping to bridge that gap, these two kids, are convinced now they can become scientists by one informal science experience inside a park on a Sunday afternoon. So that's what success looks like. Lastly, I wanna talk about a program we launched called QED with Dr. B. It's a television show. Um, it's on our public network, which is important because again, you wanna reach all populations. So you don't need cable. You don't need um, you know, a special satellite dish. This is on our public television. Um, it's every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. It's called QED with Dr. B, and it really focuses on making sure everybody can access cutting-edge science topics. So we talk about nanotechnology, vaccines, climate change, you name it, we talk about it, and it's really exciting. So with that, I want to close by saying thanks again. Um, I do have a few more slides that I will get to during the Q&A because I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Um, again, hop on at Frederick Bertley if you can. I just got on Twitter. I know I'm 20 years too late but feel free to look at it. I promise you a haiku every day, usually related to science and technology. Today's haiku was actually related to Systems 2020. So thanks again. I'll unshare my screen and take some questions. Wonderful. Thanks Thanks a lot, uh, Frederic. That was very inspirational and uh, well done for Twitter and the, and the haikus. Um, so we will um, get uh, questions via the chat. People probably need a few seconds to process what they've just heard. Meanwhile, I can maybe share the results of our poll. So we were um, asking uh, people if when thinking of social justice and uh, science learning together, they felt rather optimistic, pessimistic, mystic or somewhere in the middle and um, the results are that about one third um, of our audience today is feeling optimistic um, 
two thirds are somewhere in the middle and only two people are actually pessimistic. So we have a fairly optimistic bunch with us, I would say. Um, maybe I can, I can uh, start with a, a question of my own. Um, we, we are trying to uh, reflect on our own practice uh, with these workrooms. And I wonder if you can maybe help us spot some practices or elements that might be so deeply embedded in science learning, informal science learning, and that prevents an um, equal access um, to science. And that would have become so ingrained that they've become invisible and we don't see that they are actually preventing um, equity from, from happening. Yeah, I mean, th that's a great question. Um, I'm going to share my screen again because I actually have some slides that really, I'll use a real example that will address this um, in an important way. So hopefully this will work again. Um, let's try this. And I'm really sorry that my animations, uh oh. I'm really sorry that my animations don't work, but. No, I, this is going to be too hard to do because I can't, I was hoping to, so I'm sorry about that. I was hoping to see if I can do this. While you're doing that, I will launch a second poll. Yeah, please so you, do. And that then, buys um, you a few seconds too. Yeah. Okay. All right, are you able to see my screen? Yes, it works very right. well. Great, so now I figured out why I couldn't do this, um, the, the full animation. All right, so why is this so important? Your question is absolutely important, Ms. Becca. Let me give you some perspective. In the United States of America, okay, the highest court of the land is called the Supreme Court. Right, we have it, you have it in Europe, every country has this, right? So ours is called the Supreme Court. It's like the biggest thing. I mean, there's the President of the United States and then the Supreme Court. Well, this year we had a new justice. There are nine Supreme Court justices. The lady right there in the middle, her name is Justice Barrett. She was running, she was the last presidential appointee by President Trump to be on the Supreme Court. The woman is absolutely brilliant. Okay, she's a phenomenal scholar. She's a professor at Notre Dame, plus she was a uh, uh, justice on what's called the the um, Supreme Court, the Junior Supreme Court, and she was being nominated to be on the Supreme Court. Her husband also is a lawyer. She's brilliant. She's loved by everybody that's worked with her. She has five biological children. You see them in the photo there. Okay, so this is a woman, a husband and wife, who don't have one child. They don't have two. They don't have three. They have five biological children. Yet, out of the goodness of their heart, they went and adopted two more kids, the two kids you're seeing on the extreme, okay? Now, the, both these kids were adopted from Haiti. Now, the way the Supreme Court justice works, and if you remember the O.J. Simpson's trial, right, or, or recently the Meghan Markle, um, you know, Harry interview, or the Super Bowl, these are like the most watched things on television in the United States and sometimes around the world. Well, along that level, the nomination of this lady, the next Supreme Court justice, is watched by millions of people. So in that first day, she gets to talk, introduce herself, and then all the senators, you know, get to ask her questions. Well, this is a true story, folks. I'm not making this up. This, she gets up. She does her introductions. She talks about the loving relationship of her husband, how he's been supportive. And then she talks about her children, how much she loves her children, and she begins to describe them. I'm going to present to you exactly how she described her children. And I want to be clear. The woman is brilliant. Obviously, she cares. Obviously, she loves her family. She's going to be the, one of the next Supreme Court justice, only one of nine people out of 335 million people in the United States. This is an amazing woman, right? Well, here's what she said. Her first daughter, Emma, was a sophomore in college and might follow her parents into law. Her second daughter, Tess, is 16, loves liberal arts, has a math G. Her third child, Liam, is smart, strong, and kind. Her fourth child, 
10-year-old Juliet is already pursuing her goal of becoming an author by writing multiple essays and short stories, one in which she recently published. And her last child, Benjamin, has Down syndrome, um, and he is uh, the unanimous favorite of the whole family. She goes on to say, he was watching and hearing this morning, and she was told that he was calling out the names as he saw each kid there. This is, these are 100% quotes. Then she describes her two adopted children. First one, Vivian, was so weak that we were told she might never talk or walk normally, but she deadlifts. I don't know if you know that term in Europe. Deadlifts is a big, heavy weightlifting in the gym. Big, big amount of, of, of weight. She deadlifts as much as the male athletes at our gym. And I assure you, she has no double chalk no double talking. And then she talks about John Peter, her son, who joined us shortly after the devastating earthquake in Haiti. Um, and when he came home, still described the shock on his face when he got off the plane in winter Chicago. Once that shock wore off, he assumed the happy-go-lucky attitude that is still his signature trait. Now, you all might not know this in Europe, but in the United States, the concept of someone who's of African descent being happy-go-lucky is not a compliment. It means you're happy-go-lucky, you're not intellectual. So let me keep going. So five of her biological children, she described all of them in a cerebral context. Smart, intelligent, poetry, da-da-da, math gene. Her two Black children, who again, I know this woman loves her children. I'm not suggesting she doesn't. But she described her two Black children, one as physical, a girl who can lift more than men in the gym, and a happy-go-lucky kid. So back to your question, Ms. Becker, I mean, an important question, right? These are biases that are in people's minds. The probability of this happening by chance, it's a 2% chance that this can happen by random. That means it's 98% chance that her description was not random. So what does that tell us? That tells us that this idea of, if you're wondering, implicit bias, is it real? It is absolutely real. So to the heart and matter of your question, you know, when we want to tackle and meet people and try to help that divide, and you talked about these informal things with learning sciences that are embedded in our traditions, we have these things so hardwired in our brain that we can't even stop ourselves from, from, from sharing that. And this is amazing, right? This is a mother. She loves her children. You know, I have, I have one daughter. I couldn't imagine if I had five children, the energy to adopt the six or seven children, you're a really nice person to do that, right? You're giving them a better life, et cetera. But even with all of that, her description is interesting, right? And so to your question about how do we deal with this? The first thing is we have to be honest and we have to meet people where they're at and at best try to strip down our stereotypes, our biases that women can't be engineers, that black and brown kids can't do math, we have to forget that and try to meet them where they are and then start having dialogue and being transparent and being vulnerable. So I know that was a longer answer than you needed, but I couldn't believe when that happened, it was like, it was the perfect example because the woman is a saint, but even her in her descriptions were very biased of her own children. Thanks a lot for, uh, for that. Indeed, uh, more real than life. <laughs> demonstration of, of implicit uh, bias. So, um, Frederick, you'll be happy to hear that the second poll um, I was running was asking our audience if after hearing your speech, they're feeling more optimistic, more pessimistic or neither. And actually, you inspired two thirds of the audience to feel more optimistic about oh. informal science learning and social justice. So oh, something's going to be in exciting. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the questions that are popping up in the chat, and there are some very practical questions about the kits. Um, um, people want to know if you had sponsors, how you could afford uh, to distribute these kits for free. Um, yes, so maybe that first question. That, that's a great question. So thank you, whoever asked that question. So as you can imagine, the kits are pretty expensive. We're physically closed, so we're not getting the revenue from our foot traffic. Where did the money come from to produce this? The most amazing thing is we have two sets of kits. The ones I showed you called the learning lunch boxes that we were giving away in partnership with the Hunger Alliance and other programs. And then the second one are retail kits that you can go to our website and buy. Those, the ones you can buy are a tiny percentage of what we do. So for instance, just this past Monday, we launched for the state of Ohio, 50,000 kits 
that we're delivering in partnership with the Ohio government. Why? Because the Ohio government is funding us and paying for the production of the kits because they see the value in helping those underserved kiddos get access to stuff. So this is one of these things where, you know, we actually started developing it because we were closed and we we're like, we wanted to have people to have a hands-on impact. But then the city of Columbus, Franklin County, there's 88 counties in Ohio and in the state of Ohio saw how neat these things were and how much of an impact they had in a starving population that wanted to learn about STEM but didn't have any resources at home. They said, we will fund you. So our, the short answer, our number one sponsor, city, state, and, and um, now federal government is helping us as well. Great. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, I'm going to pick one um, from um, someone based at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, who's um, asking, um, well, sort of saying that students with special needs and English learners are often invisible uh, groups in museums. And I think it's the same here in, in, in Europe. How do we reach out to them to make sure that all students have equal access to opportunities for learning? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know you do this at the, so shout out back to the Museum of Science and Industry in, in Chicago, one of my favorite museums, um, to be fair. Um, you know, your museum and other museums do a lot of these programs where we have special programs. So for instance, we'll have, um, and it's interesting, we used to have like autism day, or we used to have, you know, deaf day or, 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 or special needs day. And we, we changed that because a, it was a label that kind of made them feel that they weren't really part of the population, but now you had this special time. So what we do instead of that is we always have different times throughout the day that certain special needs um, people can actually experience. So we everybody knows from 9 to 10 a.m., for example, we might have our lights and our exhibits dim down low. We might turn down some of the volume of some of the noise in the exhibits so that families with, with children on the autism spectrum can come in and have a really enriching experience. But I think the most important thing, and again, thanks for that question, is you got to recognize that the, the barrier is not science. The barrier is not you know, mathematics, chemistry, physics. The barrier are us as humans and the biases we have. So whether you're talking about women in science and engineering, whether you're talking about black and brown populations, whether you're talking about deaf, blind, or kids on the autism spectrum, when you recognize them as human beings equal to you with different beautiful artifacts that they got, whatever your religious <laughs> biases are in terms of how they got there, and you recognize them, then you can access the exchange of information, which if it's around science literacy, you can do that. If it's around music, you can do that. If it's around, you know, entertainment, you can do that. So it's never a content issue. It's always an interaction and a human issue. And that's the most important thing I just to close. When we talk about solving these inequity gaps in education, in healthcare disparities, whatever you want to talk about, you got to value that individual as a human first, and then you can have dialogue and they will appreciate and you'll build and solve a lot of the problems we have today. Thanks a lot, Frederick. In, in, in a way, I guess it gives us hope because um, some um, STEM professionals think that they have a specific problem with science, but maybe not. It's just a human problem. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the last thing I'll say is all of us are born from, from our moms and we come out. How do we learn to talk, walk and do all the things we do? We're scientists by definition. We try it, it fails. We try it again, it fails. We're born scientists. And then somewhere through school or whatever, you know, we lose that. And, and so you're absolutely right. 